I started hearing things outside the tent, but I drift back to sleep. I wake up and hear it again. And finally, I remember just feeling the nylon of the tent moving as something pressed against it. And I could hear sniffing and the snout just press against the side of the tent and along where my face was. And I was paralyzed in fear as this was happening. The story of how I came to Africa and the adventures I had there are almost unbelievable. In the summer of 2008, I was a 19 year old bank teller in my home state of Kansas. I was enrolled in the local community college there I had never left the United States before. I was extremely sheltered. I had grown up reading books about travel and adventure in exotic land, and Africa was the place I most wanted to see. I remember in 2000, an ecologist, Mike Fay, sponsored by National Geographic, had traveled across the entire Congo Basin, uh, some like 2,000 miles. He brought back photos and stories about elephants and gorillas and chimpanzees that I'd never had contact with humans before. He was seeing places that no Westerner had ever been before. And I remember his lead photographer, Nick Nichols, captured an image of a bongo antelope, uh, which is this large uh, red and white striped antelope with spiral horns. When I saw that photo, I was struck with this sense of like, wonder that such an animal could exist in the world and without me ever knowing it, it was there. And from then on, I was obsessed with the idea of going to Africa, specifically Central Africa. So after graduating high school, I was following the path that everybody was pushing me to follow, you know, get a good career, go to college. And I felt the pressure of that. On top of that, I was experiencing extreme wanderlust. I wanted to get out of the Midwest where I had always been my whole life. The boredom was near the point of madness at this point. I remembered I started emailing uh, different safari companies in Africa seeking a job and I was turned down so many times or completely ignored altogether. And I was doing this for a few months and I had basically given up hope on ever making it to Africa this way. And one night I was following this rabbit hole on these online forums and I found, um, I found out about this guy, this young Swedish guy named Eric Marav that had just started his own safari company in a country called the Central African Republic. What these people were saying about this place was that it had never been really formally explored by Westerners before. It was a big blank spot on the map and that piqued my interest uh, quite a lot. And so I randomly uh, reached out to this guy, emailed him, and I don't even remember what I was, what exactly I said. I was just like expressing an interest in his area. A few weeks later, out of the blue, he emailed me back and it started this correspondence back and forth. And out of nowhere, he just said, like, I can tell you're really interested in Africa. If you want to come work for me, I can probably make that happen for you. He told me that he could pay for my entire trip. Uh, I would fly out there, but it would be an unpaid apprenticeship. So I would have to commit to at least nine months um, of no pay. And if he liked me, if we worked well together, then I could come back. Needless to say, I jumped at this opportunity and my parents weren't too excited about the fact that I was flying to Africa to meet this stranger who I had only talked to online. Within a couple months, I found myself trading my suit and tie that I wore at the bank every day to khakis and a rucksack and a rifle and I was standing on the banks of this river in the Central African Republic called the Ambari. And I remember looking across on the other side and everybody told me like, when you cross over, that is the unknown land. Like that land has never been explored before us. 
at the time, Eric was only 22, so he was three years older than me, but because he was born and raised in Africa and had grown up there, he had the wisdom, the work ethic of somebody twice his age. He was just this self-assured, confident explorer. I knew immediately that I would follow him anywhere. I'll never forget my first night in our main safari camp. The staff slept in these uh, little grass roof bungalows, and but when we first got there, they were caved in from the rainy season. They had taken quite the beating, and so the roofs were being replaced. And so in the meantime, uh, I was sleeping outside in the small tent. And mind you, I'm already a little freaked out like by all the noises around me late at night, and I'm already on edge. I started hearing things outside the tent and I was getting progressively more nervous and nervous and but I drift back to sleep I wake up and hear it again and finally I remember just feeling the nylon of the tent moving as something pressed against it and I could hear sniffing and the snout just press against the side of the tent and along where my face was and I was paralyzed in fear as this was happening. I didn't know what it was. I didn't know if it was a lion. I, I had no idea what it was. And there was another guy, uh, Simon, another Swedish guy asleep next to me and uh, in another tent. And um, I was like trying to say his name, but I was too scared to really talk because I didn't want to like instigate whatever this thing was out there. Finally, after after being there for a long time, I mean, probably 20 minutes of just being terrified I I grew really impatient by whatever it was and I don't know why I did it but in a burst of adrenaline I was in my undies I had a super bright flashlight I just started yelling I unzipped the tent I opened it up and I just shined the light and there was this hyena just running away that incident really shook me and I was really freaked out it's funny because I remember those first incidents like that very clearly but over time they would become so normal that they were unremarkable and when that happened in the future something like that I, I don't even remember it at all hyenas in the end just didn't really bother me Kosho camp was situated on the edge of the Kosho river and there was big crocodiles in that river but you never saw them uh, in the daytime or you never saw them right in front of camp where they were kind of skittish after hearing all the noises coming from camp. But just their presence was, was always there and intimidating. We had beautiful colobus monkeys in the trees above camp. Like we had a whole family of them. Um, we had at least one female leopard that just patrolled camp at nighttime. And we'd see her a couple times either late at night or in the morning. There was a mineral lick across the camp and antelope would come and feed during the day wearily. Occasionally we'd hear lions roaring from camp. For me, having been a sheltered kid growing up in the Midwest, it was just super surreal being there. My main task the first couple months that I was there was to get acquainted with the bush and to also help open up the safari roads. This meant I would go out with a group of a small handful of local African guys and just me and them and we would clear the brush of the old safari roads that had, had been uh, overgrown during the rainy season. We slept next to a campfire on the side of the car every single night and we would do this for weeks at a time. It was on one of these trips that I heard lions roaring for the first time. I'll never forget that night we were laying on this kind of hard slab of uh, like granite and we had been sitting next to a campfire and the embers were kind of going down and it was pretty late. I think there was four guys with me, four local guys, and we heard this hyena start to whoop. And the guys just laughed at the hyena sounds because they just sound so ridiculous. And we were all laughing. And then in the distance, there was this kind of low rumble, almost like thunder, 
like a like muffled thunder and the guys with me immediately went silent they had been laughing and smiling and they immediately went silent and that rumbling just increased again and again louder and louder and there was something so familiar so primal to that sound but i couldn't quite fit, put my finger on it and i could see from the edge of the campfire the guys faces and they all looked very serious one of the guys looked at me and he saw that i was curious about the sound and he said under his breath bamara which in sango means lion it just sent a charge of electricity through my entire body once I heard that. Those first uh, months in the bush were unforgettable. I learned a lot from the local Africans. Not only did I start to pick up the language Songo from them, but they taught me just bushcraft in general. They taught me how to make fires, uh, even in the rain. They taught me how to raid beehives for wild honey. They showed me all kinds of animal signs, tracks. They showed me edible fruits, nuts, plants, and medicinal plants as well. They taught me how to call in uh, forest dikers by making this nasally sound. Meow, meow. <laughs> and we would sit and make this sound in the forest and these dikers would just come running in to defend their territory. And I always had a small rifle with me, and so I'd shoot one, and uh, we would live off that for a couple days. They taught me to avoid certain dangers. Um, I remember one night, I went to sit down in this kind of leaf litter, and one of the guys had a machete, and he just swung it right next to me. And it cut this uh, green night otter in half, and I had literally almost sat on top of this snake. But the most memorable tasks we did during this time was take long multi-day backpacking expeditions into uncharted areas just to get a feel for the land and see what kind of animals were found there. These few months felt like a lifetime but I didn't know back then that that was only just the beginning. I was only just getting started. What was supposed to be nine months in Africa ended up being five long years of exploring some of the last uncharted places left in all of Central Africa. The intimate wildlife encounters I would have are uncountable. I played tag with two elephants one time. Another time I almost stepped on a sleeping lion in the long grass during a rainstorm. I would wrestle crocodiles, uh, one time even getting bit on the arm. My life was threatened on many occasions, as were my coworkers there as well. I contracted malaria multiple times, uh, dysentery once, and I even had a gallstone block my gallbladder duct, um, which very nearly killed me. In the later years, we would have armed rebel groups in our area and one time I ended up staring down the barrel of an AK-47 held by a very angry teenage boy. Eventually, it would be the Civil War of the Central African Republic in 2013 that ended my time there. But before we would leave the area, we would end up transforming our hunting concession into a nature preserve that is now protected and managed by the well-known organization African Parks. I'm kickstarting this new vlog series called Tales from the Bush, where every few weeks I'm going to be sharing stories from my time in the African wilderness. In the next episode, I'm going to be sharing a story about discovering a hidden lake. In the night, a pair of highly endangered Central African elephants came blundering into my remote campsite.
Real quickly guys, I just wanted to give you an update on my book situation. In a couple weeks, I graduate uh, Colorado State University with my journalism and media communication uh, bachelor's degree. Now that I've finished that, I'm focusing heavily on my, my book project, my memoir of the five years I lived in the Central African Republic working as a safari guide and exploring a remote wilderness area there, which has taken me multiple years to complete. I've really put my heart and soul into this. And I've been in contact with some of the harder to reach literary agencies in New York City. And some of them have shown interest, but the feedback I'm getting is basically they're like, go back, uh, sharpen up your manuscript. Fair enough. I'm going back. I'm doing that. Um, the other thing they told me, which I think is a little ridiculous, is they're basically saying, you're starting out your career, not many people know who you are, so you need to have a bigger footprint online. You need to have more followers. Um, so basically, uh, I need to grow my following uh, to use that as leverage for these literary agents who are then going to take my manuscript and submit it to some of the bigger publishers. So what I'm asking from you guys is, if you're interested in my stories, uh, just Hit, hit the subscribe button, follow me on YouTube, follow me on Instagram. Um, I'd really appreciate that. Like the more followers I have, the more people I have behind me, the, the better chance I have of actually getting this book on all the major bookshelves in the US. That would be a dream come true. Like I said, I really appreciate the support so far and uh, I look forward to bringing these stories out to you guys. Thanks a lot.